If you've got your Bibles, I'm going to have you turn to Isaiah chapter 52. I'm sorry, 54, verse 2. Isaiah 54, verse 2. And again, if you have your Bibles, that'd be great, because you're going to want to underline it. Put a little asterisk by it. Uh, otherwise, for the rest of you, it'll be up on the trons. There it is right there. If you're reading through the Bible in a year, I, I believe it was this Wednesday that uh, this was in the, the daily reading. As I'm reading along, it's like right away it just brought back all kinds of emotions and feelings because this verse was instrumental in us being in this particular building that we are sitting in now. It says, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. This morning is going to be a little different. You can uh, pretty much close up your Bibles uh, right from there. It's kind of a, it's going to be a little bit of a, a family meeting, uh, a sort of, but also when you think about it, you know, Revelation 11 says that, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. This morning is going to be a lot of testimony, uh, just giving God thanks what I'd like to just entitle the message is expanding our influence. But what I'm going to do in the process is bring you back and do a little bit of recapping some history, telling you where we've been, where we are, and then painting the picture with a little bit of challenge with where we're going. Some of the things I'm going to have to share with you, some of you have heard before. Majority of the information, many of you are just going to, you have no clue. You're just like, wow, I never knew. I didn't know they did that. I didn't know this happened. So it's like, wow. Expanding our influence. It was April of 1996 that I went down to Brownsville, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, there was a revival. In 1995, it was Father's Day message. John Kilpatrick was, uh, came. They had Stephen Hill as a guest. Anyway, the power of God fell down in that place and changed it for a few years. I mean, they had revival. People coming from all over the world. I was not aware of that. Okay, everybody heard about the problem? I was not aware of that. Um, I went down for a pastor's conference in April of 96 that was being advertised. You know, here's the deal. I, there's a lot of things that pass my desk all the time. You know, I mean, out in Phoenix, uh, Tony Barnett, um, others around. All different kinds of places you can go as a pastor. You know, we're having this conference. We're having this on leadership. We're having this. And I usually, they cross my desk. I look at them and I go, nah, throw them You know, I'm just, I'm not really interested. I don't know why this one here had glue stuck to it. I, I couldn't throw it away. It just kind of sat on my desk. And I had just this drawing, this, this weird feeling. And again, I had no idea why. I wasn't aware of the fact that there was a revival going on down there at all. But I looked at this thing, and the more I kind of thought about it, because it, it just wouldn't go in the trash can, I thought, you know, yeah, I just feel, I, I think I should, I think I got to go to this, this pastor's conference down in Brownsville. So I'll make a long story short, I went. And oh my goodness. Again, I didn't know there was revival going on there. Walked in the place. This was back before I had uh, LASIK surgery. I wore glasses. Let me tell you what, the worship was intense. Just, I mean, people just basking in his presence. We love you, Lord. You alone are holy, O oh God. And we worship you. You, O oh Lord, are a great and mighty king. And we worship you. Shalalala maho shaki da bahai. Shalalala maho shaki da bahai. And you get about 3,000 people because they open it up in the evening services, not just for the pastor's conference. But for other people that were, that were coming every night by the thousands. The pastor's conference was during the day. That night we came into this place of worship. And we were, and it just, the worship was so incredible. The presence of God was, for lack of a better word, heavy. Okay? I'm not sure if that's a theological accuracy, but it was just a heaviness. In fact, so I'd be just worshiping in just this place. is just this basking in his presence, worshiping, adoring him. And I'm bawling. So I take my glasses off and I'm, I'm wiping the tears out of my face. I put my glasses back on. I mean, moments later, I'm, oh, I gotta take my, I'm wiping my tears. And I, put, I mean, I got sick and tired of poking myself in the eye. Eventually, I just took my glasses off and I put them in my pocket and just bawled in his presence. There was a whistling sound up in the very center of the sanctuary. 
I had this thought, I think there's angels up there whipping around. And I didn't want to open my eyes after I thought that because then I thought, I'll be, think, Mike, you're goofy. What do you mean you're, yeah, I mean, you're goofy. You think you're going to open up your eyes and see angels up there. Because there was this distinct sound that was like a rush of a mighty wind up there. It was just... And I thought, oh, I can't look because now it'd be too weird. Well, curiosity kills the cat and killed me too. <laughs> I look. I didn't see any angels. But the presence in that place was rich. It was just heavy. Next day at pastor's conference continued. I think it was day three in the conference that John Kilpatrick stepped out onto the platform. And again, the pastor's conference, there's only 200, if, if I remember right, about 200 pastors there. So it was a rather small group. So he addressed them by telling them and saying, I just got a telegraph. I just got a telegraph message from Paul young Cho in Seoul, South Korea. He was aware that this pastor's conference was going on. He said, I've been, I was in prayer. I was in prayer this morning. Okay. Bad. It, did you like it? <laughs> Thanks, Keith. You're a good man. Uh, um, he said, in prayer this morning, he said, the Holy Spirit firmly impressed upon me to send this message to you. That there are pastors there that you're considering building. And we were. We were in our old building. We were in the process of building or, or look and find a property to, to move and add on and build. So he says, I felt this urgent from the Holy Spirit. You've got to tell the pastors there that if you are planning to build, set your tent stakes out wide. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm sitting there, I'm going, oh my God. I mean, it just resonated. I was like, wow. It, it mustered up some courage. You know, vision sometimes does that. Musters up courage, sometimes more courage than smarts, but it mustered up courage. I went to back my hotel, my hotel room that night after the service was done, the evening service, and I went back to my service, and um, Orlene wasn't there, so you had you time on your hands. It's like, you know, what are you going to... So I, oh, I'm reading in the Bible, and I came across 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. And it says, Because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. Now, I have to admit, when you read the first part of that verse, it's like, woo! Again, it's just filled with this sense of confidence and a sense of, yes, there's a wide open door. I felt that confirmed when John Kilpatrick read the telegraph message from Paul Yonggi Cho to that group. I felt that same thing. Now, I'm in my devotions, and the, and the words literally are leaping off the page, penetrating my heart by the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, there's a wide open door. I'm feeling the, the conviction of God that yes, go out, expand the tent stakes, your tent. But I don't like the last part of that verse. But I felt like that was true too. And there are many who oppose me. And you know, I have found out as we went through this process, there was a lot of opposition. But friends, here's the thing you need to realize, even in your personal life, if God's calling you to something, don't be surprised, we have an enemy. Why should we be so surprised that if God's calling you to something that there's not going to be opposition? Some of us have harbored this mythological idea that, well, if God calls you, it's just going to be easy. Leaving Egypt, going into the promised land wasn't easy, but it was promised. Amen? Whenever God promises you something, you hang on to the fulfillment that it is true. It is going to happen. Now, between here and there, there may be hell to pay. Can I, can I say that? There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be opposition. But know this. When God spoke it, God speaks it into your life, whatever he's doing in your life, know this. You're going to press on to that mark. There is a wide open door for effective ministry. And there are many who oppose me. You know something? We're here. Amen? I tell you what, it was an interesting process. Let me just give you just a really quick, like I said, just sharing a little bit of history of this idea and this challenge because of this verse had tremendous meaning quite a few years ago, back in 1996, started then. And then this, this last week, I'm reading my devotions, I had this verse, and I'm just like, wow, God, I think about this. God, you, you have used Maranatha, this little band of, you know, kind of misfit 
people who get saved and they're dysfunctional. Praise God loves dysfunctional people. Amen. Hallelujah. I know he does because I feel his love every day. <laughs> but we were searching for property. I mean, we searched for property in the south end of town, on the west end of town. We were looking across from 61 over here where we are. Um, at one point, I flew out to Seattle to meet with a property owner that owned property across here. I mean, we were looking all over, nothing, nothing, nothing. I was sharing this with, um, at a pastor's meeting one time, the local pastors. And um, that next Sunday, Pastor Bill Orris, the pastor then of Crossroads Covenant Church, he said to his congregation on one Sunday morning, he says, you guys, we've got to pray for Maranatha. They have been looking for property. We need to pray that God will guide them and give them some property. So he prayed. He led the congregation in prayer. After the, after the service, uh, Bruce Carlson, one of uh, the guys committed to the church there, that Sunday, he talks to his dad after the church service. Um, I'm not sure if his dad went there or not, but like they go over to his parents' house for dinner. They said, he said, Dad, he said, you know, you got property up in 61. You should think about selling that to Maranatha. Guess what? This is that property. It happened. I mean, it just began from that. Pastor Bill, Bruce mentioned to his dad. His dad made contact. We was like, and guess what? Here we are. It's amazing how God works, isn't it? We built this building. We got occupancy on this building. In fact, um, it was a little bit of a laughing stock, tongue in cheek sort of thing when we were building it because in the newspaper, the Forest Lake Times, there's a thing that says, Is Maranatha building an airplane hangar? I mean, when these structures were going up, these steel buildings, it looked like just this big, humongous, you know, building. We got occupancy November 20th, 2001. And we got here, we realized, you know something? We truly have enlarged the place of our tent. Um, those of you who didn't know it, this is a picture of our old building. This was a, where, kind of where by where Cub is now. Um, behind that building, see that row of trees? That's, and actually, that, and then down farther, that's actually where Cub is. We always say the property where Cub is. It's not exactly accurate. That's the parking lot right in front of uh, Starbucks. Okay, that's that corner of the parking lot and all that kind of thing. So that was our building. We enjoyed that for about 12 years. Then the fire department burnt it down. They used it for fire practice. And uh, we thought that was cool. Even with its last breath, the building was serving its community. Thought it was great. Some, built, some firemen were spooked. They were spooked. In fact, I got a call from the fire chief that Friday before the burning. He says, hey, we got some guys that are spooked. We got several departments coming. And they're like, we're burning a church? On Sunday? <laughs> so he asked me, he says, hey, would you be willing to come out and talk to the guys? Great opportunity. I'd love to. So I showed up bright and early before service. I met all the guys out there and said, hey, I guess I want you to know I'm you know, the pastor of the church. And some of you may be kind of worried you're burning a church on a Sunday and everything else. You need to realize this. This is not the house of God. This is a tool. Kind of like your, your oxygen tank and your axe. It's a tool that you use to save lives. I said that tool is a tool that's used to save lives. So even with its last breath, if it can be used as a tool to help train you better to save more lives, it is the greatest gift to the community that we could have. So I said, you need to relax. It's not a... So, so I said, hey, can we pray? Yeah. So I said, let's pray. We need to pray for safety because of what you're going to be doing in here later today. Uh, we need to pray for safety and pray like After church, I got a phone call. Um... You got to call us and say, listen, Pastor Mike, I want to thank you for showing up and praying out there because six of us were almost killed. We were going in the building and, you know, the, the building, they had done several burns, put it out, burn, put it out, burn, put it out, and they did several tests through all the different office areas and then now they're in the main sanctuary area. We have this on tape. It's incredible to see. These guys were just getting sent in and they heard this cracking and all that and they were told to get out of there really quick. So they turned just as they did. The ceiling collapsed on this end and the wall collapsed in. He said, thanks for coming out and praying for us. And I mean, it was cool. Okay, I told more of the story than I thought I was gonna. Um, interesting stuff though, isn't it? Yes, Dan. The 
the story of the church building. Isn't that cool? It has made a lasting impact. Praise God. That's so cool. Thanks for interrupting my message. <laughs> no, I mean, if you're going to interrupt it with news like that, I, I think it's great. No, thanks, Dan. That is, that is just really, really exciting. Now, here's what's really interesting. We went from that old building to this building here. It was 50,000 square feet. I mean, you know, it, it was just huge. Two years after we were in here, we added another 30,000 square feet. That whole double story education wing on that end of the building, we added it two, two years after we got here. Now, let me just back up just a little bit. Right about the same time that we are getting ready to build this building, the district office comes to me and says, hey, Mike, we got this church in North Branch. Would you be willing to take it over? And I'm just like, oh my goodness. I mean, I mean like own it. Run it, take care of it. In other words, when you own it, you're responsible for the payments is really what he was saying. <laughs> you own it, it's yours, you know. And I, I, the district office, our church was the very first time something like that ever took place. Brother St. John and I went up to a meeting with the church congregation at that time, which was six people. And I basically was saying, listen, I want to I be the senior pastor of this church. And they looked at me and they go, you mean you're going to leave Maranatha to come up here? I looked at him and said, no. Now I'm thinking to myself, do I look crazy? I said, I said no, I'm not going to do that. And again, something I didn't say, but I thought to myself is, you need to realize this. We have hundreds of lay people that lead Bible studies with, that are bigger than this. You know? So I said, I, I'm going to be your pastor. I'm going to run it with other staff and other things, but yeah, I'm going to do this. This was 1996. I said, yeah, we'll do that. And uh, so Brother St. John, I remember, I'll never forget him telling them people, he says, listen, if you do this, if you hire Mike to be your pastor, he will ruin your church. <laughs> and we did. We ruined it. It grew. I mean, we, we ruined that. I mean, it was kind of a pun. You, you, I hope you're following me. Okay. What happened was my brother Kevin, who was on staff here, he became the pastor up there, was driving up for a long time, and uh, God would use him, give him great direction. The church has grown. The church has got healthy. Uh, they ended up renovating the building that they were in, selling that building, building across town. Some of you know where uh, Access Church is in North Branch. Um, healthy church, vibrant, impacting its community. So I started thinking about this, expanding your tent. Not only did we expand our tent by building something that was so much bigger, but we expanded all the way up to North Branch. This past week, as I started thinking about this building, this expansion, in that particular verse, it, it dawned on me kind of this week as I was praying. That's why I just want to share with you because so much that, that you're probably not aware of. You see, enlarging the place of your tent wasn't just the tent, the meeting, because the tent is also that symbol of the place of planning and strategy. Enlarge the place of your tent. Enlarge and expand the area of influence. Let me just tell you what. We have had the privilege of being in this new building and really expanding beyond just this building into influencing our community. Um, the Republican Convention has been using our building for the last several years. They use this as their district-wide whatever gathering place. Um, Boy Scouts used our building for years. They have many times held their district Pinewood Derby race from the huge district. Hundreds of parents come and use our building for their Pinewood Derby car race. Um, police officers on a regular basis use our gym and our building to train and to exercise, to perfect. They do, they do training for uh, you know, uh, self-defense tactics and things like that. They do it when they're going to hire a new recruit, uh, a new convert, <laughs> kind of. They bring them in, run through the paces. They use our building to do that. Our building was used for a live active shooters deal. Four or five different departments came here to our building and used our building in the totality of it. In fact, afterwards, uh, the guy in charge says, Mike, I'm really sorry, man. We got a couple holes in your wall back there for some bullets. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> That is not the response he was expecting. You know, most people are like, oh, you can't touch the dirty, you know, the, the, the walls and you can't dirty this. Man, they had smoke bombs going off and I said, hey, do whatever you got to do. Again, this building is a tool. This is not the house of God. It's a tool. 
Let's use it. So many people, oh, we can't do this. Hey, if you get the paint, the wall's dirty, we'll repaint. So we got a couple of little nicks in the wall from these rubber bullets that were going at high speed. And they got dents in. I'm really sorry. I said, don't worry, man. We can fix that. That's, I think that kind of stuff brings glory to God. I do. Maybe I'm just weird, but don't answer that. I mean, I think that kind of stuff just brings glory to God. Gets used for all that kind of stuff. Uh, our, our building has been asked by the National Red Cross to be a center in, a, in an event of a national tragedy, in a crisis. Uh, our building is used as a voting place in the community. Wyoming City, when they have big items going on, they use this facility for their city hall meetings. Um, the Chisago County Services, all of the public Chisago County Services, they meet here once a year. And all the different resources from, from food stamps to uh, WIC to, uh, I mean, just a myriad of things. They use this place to gather all that kind of stuff. We got wonderful little outlines, our little happenings too that again, not really affected to our church, but Mama Jew, she's in the kitchen right now, working hard. We got bountiful blessings that's working out of here. There's a lady, we, I don't know her name, but we call her the bread lady. She uses our kitchen once a month for her business. She gathers together and, and sorts and goes through um, a whole bunch of wheat products. She grinds it, she bags it, and then she sells it and comes right all right out of here. You know, the first thought, like I said, for enlarge the place of your tent, you think of the building. But this week I started to think even more. It's not just the building. It's the influence. Expanding the influence. When I think about expanding the influence, I think of a couple things. Number one, I think about a lot of the ministries that are going on now because of this. And I'm just going to only list a couple, okay? But ministry that's going on now, today, because of this place, what's happened here. I'm only going to mention a couple. Scott and Joy Jensen, they came on as, as young North Central College students. They came back in the early days. Um, they were just interning. And then it grew into a youth pastor job. And he was a youth pastor. Um, even though he was from Wisconsin, we kept him. Um, <laughs> Him and Joy did, they, they, they got married and they, they were hanging out here. They did really good. They lived with Pat and Carol Morley uh, for a while. Um, did a good job. He went on from here to pastor a church down in St. Paul. What he brought with him was Maranatha's ministry philosophy. And then from there he went out to Montana. And then he came back to, to Minnesota to get his uh, more education, his doctorate in, um, or master's I believe in um, Bethel Seminary. And today he's working in a, in a hospital down in the cities. Uh, I think of this uh, Chris Corbett, interesting name. Some of you who have been around a long time, you remember Chris Corbett. Same thing. She came as a North Central intern, got here, got in, in, introduced to children's ministry from Pastor Carol in her department under her uh, tutelage and mentorship. And she grew and she developed and she in, in got a whole different view of what ministry is like. She ended up becoming, for the Minnesota Assembly of God, the District of Minnesota, she became the head children's director. Beyond that, through her education and in her ministry, she became the director of the children's department at North Central University. She was the top dog in children's ministry. You know where that came from? Came from right here. Pat the person in, back in front of you. Just reach up and just go pat him, okay? Just pat the back in front of you. God is good because you know God uses us to provide influence outside of this thing. Um, Andy, uh, right now off the top of my head I forget Andy's name, but he was here as a youth pastor as well. Internship. He now, what's his name? Yeah. Andy Cass. Yes, thank you Pastor Dylan. Andy Cass. He left here. Wherever I go in the district, I just saw him at the last prayer and fasting retreat. Whenever he sees me, he's like, Mike! Whoa! And he's so appreciative for his time here. He's always way more than what he should. He's just like, well, I thank God for your influence and blah. Pastor Travis does the same thing. Oh. He's been for the last 14 years a youth pastor at one of our larger churches, Rochester Assembly in Rochester. Um, he's since gotten married. He's got two kids. Life's gotten kind of busy for him. Woohoo! Travis and Carrie, I hope they do something for God someday. Um, 
Jody, J Jody Bonin. I mean, you know, she was here, got brought up within the church, felt called, followed everything. Now where is she? She's youth pastoring out in Montana. Friends, enlarge the place of your tent meant more than and means more, as I was thinking about this, more than just our building. I think about, like I said, so many other names I could, I could name. Health. Healthy church makes healthy leaders. Do you realize that the majority of the staff that we have here have been raised up right from within? We haven't had to go out to get them, to bring them here. We've raised them up right inside. Not only that, but we've raised them up and then we send them out. Um, it's interesting. Um, there's some really exciting news. You're going to hear about it in the very near future about Dan Borchardt. He, uh, again, got saved here. Came to year, he came to church here for years with a bright red nose. Finally, one day, fog clears. He gives his life to Jesus. He gets going. He goes through Alpha. Again, surrenders his life. Gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, felt called to the ministry. Follows the, the, the schooling. He has been for you the leader of Alpha for many years. He's done, teached and led Wednesday nights. He's done Sunday mornings. Um, he is on the very cusp of being a, a senior pastor at a church. It's like expanding. Okay. Um, expanding in, in as far as the form of ministers we have expanded our tent but also I just think about the, the multitude of ministries most of which you guys are not aware you are not aware of the fact that we're a Red Cross Center you're not even aware of all the police officer training that takes place here you're not aware of the fact that the, Ro the Boy Scouts use this place you're, you're not aware of half that stuff were you and I could just keep going let me tell you about some of the ministries okay some of the ministries Enlarging the place of your tent. Think about, it's coming up in a couple short weeks. The Halloween stop. The Halloween thing that the children's department, Pastor Robin puts on here, is like second to none. This thing is huge. It's, it's, and so many of you have to get involved to make it happen because it's huge. And it ministers to so many. I am running into people all the time. Hey, you're the pastor that does that Halloween thing. Yeah, my wife and our kids, we come there every year. We, you know, it's like... Yeah, well, you ever thought about coming any other time during the year? <laughs> you know, we meet like every Sunday. Um, here's the deal. They, they don't right away, but real often what happens is it reached an influence, and all of a sudden someday a tragedy comes in their life, and they're wondering, we have nowhere to go. We don't have a church home. Hey, you know, there's that church, and then they come. I think about the women's ministries. Women's ministries, man, you got Christmas tea, you got girlfriend's banquet, you got spa nights, you got the mom's night out, you got the arts thing, um, which I don't know what in the world you do there, but it's, they say it's fun. You got one Saturday morning, you got many Bible studies, fellowship groups. I mean, the cup of faith. Do you realize what the cup of faith does? The cup of faith reaches down into Minneapolis to minister to broken women that have been trafficked and abused. Some don't even know it. It's just their lifestyle. The cup of faith reaches out and pours out the love of Christ. Once a month, they go down there and they give gifts to these young ladies that show nothing but just Christ's love. They don't get preached to. It's incredible. The car show. Car show's been going on for 25 years. 25 years! Oh my gosh! Brian Collins has gotten old. Twenty-five years in the influence. I mean, name after name. Just out of curiosity, are there any of you in here? The car show was the very first introduction you had to the church. Raise your hand. The car show. Just curious. Okay. Yep. You too. Uh, yep. Yes, right. You were just driving by and you see all these cars being car people. That's right. I remember that. What an interesting story. They go car show. Let's go see what that is. Oh God, it's at church. Karate. Mark Svenkinson, for the last 16 years, has led a karate group that's growing. Twice, we have hosted and been the host site for the international uh, competition. People come from all over to compete right here in this building. Boxing. Dan Whitty started it. Rachel now is in charge of it. On um, the boxing that reaches out, again, to the inner city and around. Just phenomenal. The bike blessing. Do you realize 450 motorcycles drove through our lobby this year? 
And every one of them. You're not going to believe what I did last week. I drove my bike through a church. No way. Yeah, I did. I drove it through a church. <laughs> well, where'd you do that? I was up in Forest Lake. Up there. They, they drive right through the church. I guess a lot of bikers talk like they're retarded. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, I cupped my hand just to direct it right into the microphone. Yeah, that was really good. Man, the car show, karate, boxing, bike blessing, the Union Gospel Mission, Patty Callahan goes down to the Union Gospel Mission, comes out of here, they go down there, ministering down there, the prison ministry, Mark Diamond, for years has been going to Lionel Lakes, bringing the love of Christ, speaking truth into teenagers' lives. And he tells me how many times, Mike, you're not going to believe what I get to say. I get to say stuff I never imagined I'd be able to say to these kids. Some of the questions they ask, some of the reality from the crap that they've been through. And they ask me, how could God ever forgive me? Or why does this happen? And he gets to speak right into their lives. Man, for 35 years, there's been this thing called a Friday morning Bible study that goes on. I've led the Friday morning Bible study for 35 years. <laughs> 6.30 in the morning, and we go from there. Uh, right following that is the seniors' Bible study. You know, the seniors, they gather. What a nice group that's meeting there. My, my dad, Pastor Doug, he's been leading that for years and just recently turned it over to Mick. Mick's been leading it for a while. But again, I think about in the community, what we've done in the community. Um, we give $500 to $1,000 every year to the Explorers Program. This is young kids, teenagers, coming up in the police department to try to think about might they be interested? We give 500 to 1,000 dollars every year to the safety program. The police officers, Force Lake Police Department puts on a safety uh, program where they give away bicycle helmets and stuff like that for kids. We donate to that. Um, we helped raise money and donate for the police dog that, was, that Force Lake had a few years back. Um, we helped buy, not help, we bought the Jaws of Life for the Wyoming Fire Department. We bought lockers for the Wyoming Fire Department. We bought walkie-talkies. Um, we bought a heart start machine for the Forest Lake um, Police Department. I mean, involved in the community. Think about all the things we've done. Treetop Kids, Pastor Tony and Jill Gazelle, man, they've been praying for years for property. And they run their ministry tightly connected with Pastor Robin and our kids' ministry here, connected at church. But he's got an incredible ministry. And now, God's answered a prayer for them to have their own property their own farm, which opens up all kinds of possibility for just even more expanded and intense ministry, and it's right in Scandia, Minnesota. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I think about all the missionaries that we support that are around the world. Think about the Gideons. We're a big part of the Gideons. In fact, they're coming up. It's October. They're going to be here in a couple of weeks. Minnesota Teen Challenge. We got a guy who ministers down Sturgis in Daytona. We support him. The quarterly team training. Friends, it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. I asked my wife and I were talking just the other day. I said, honey, I remember back in the day we had 101 various ministries that came out of Maranatha. She said, Mike, a couple months ago I went through and counted them. There were over 120. I've just listed a few of the various ministries. Wednesday, I'm going through my devotions. I'm reading, expand, you know, the, the stakes of your, t enlarge the place of your tent. And I think back, I think, God, you have enlarged the place of this tent in a huge way. I want to just close with telling you four, four things that I've envisioned seeing right on the horizon. It's things that we need to be involved with and get involved in doing right now. Boy, did I say something wrong? <laughs> wow. Four things, and with this I want to just cast a little vision. I want to just kind of help you to understand and see that this is where we've been, and look at what God's done. Guess what? It's not over till the fat angel sings, right? I haven't heard the fat angel sing yet. We must do the works of him who sent us while it is yet day, because night comes when no man can work. Four things. Number one, this capital campaign that we're in. We are halfway through it. 
Those of you who are newer to the church, I invite you to come join us because there's something exciting about being a part of what God is doing. It's a little behind. For those of you who are behind, no condemnation, but I want to really jack you up. I want you to encourage you. Guess what? This is something that God gave to us. We have to take good care of it. This is a tool. This is a tool that God uses us to be able to minister to others. If we don't take care of this, just let it fall apart, that is going to be absolutely horrible. We need to be good stewards of it. We need to sharpen it. We need to show appreciation for what God has done. Now here's the thing. Um, we need like new carpeting in here. Look, see this hole in the carpeting down there? This carpeting is 16 years old. And it was only meant to last seven years. I think we've gotten good use out of it. Amen? But do you know whose carpeting this is? It's yours, not mine. It's yours. This is not my responsibility. Yeah. Well, I'll take a little bit because I'm, I'm a part of this. It's our responsibility to keep track of and, to, and, and use the, this, this tool that God has given us to be effective. Now, I mean, when things in your house break, you fix them eventually. If you're like me, it's eventually is the key word there. It happens all the time. Things don't just fix themselves. I can just tell you this right now with the capital campaign. Some of you, you've heard it already, but we've spent $300,000 for a new sound system, new projection, and new, new, th new, new lighting. It's been great. Um, we have spent $40,000 a little earlier than that on these house lights, all replaced with LED that in the long run is going to save money. Cost, it cuts down the cost of use incredibly. Our roof, they've been working on it for the last three weeks. They're just finishing up the leaks that we had. That was the tune of $130,000. And that came in under budget to fix the roof. You notice the lobby, because we had a leaky roof, had a lot of ceiling tiles that were yellow and stained. All the ceiling tiles in the lobby, if you look, they're all brand new. They've all been done. That was to the tune of $13,000. Um, aren't you glad the lobby at your house is not as big as the lobby here? I mean, $13,000 just to replace ceiling tile? You know the cracks out in the parking lot? You got to take care of a parking lot because if you don't take care of the parking lot, it's going to be all tore up and it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do you realize that we just paid $3,800 just to seal the cracks? We do that every couple of years because every third or fourth year, we have to totally seal the blacktop all over again. You know how much that costs? $20,000. It's like, wow. Guys, guess what? We've been called to this. We, we get to go after it. We really do. Secondly, we have a radio station. Something that many of you probably haven't heard about because we haven't really sounded the horn a lot, but we have a radio station. It is a full-powered FM radio station. One of the last ones to be handed out by the FCC. Um, Kevin and Jill Ritchie um, owned it. They gave in large part, the, the radio to the church. We have since had to pay some FCC stuff and buy some equipment. Our radio is hosted in one of the back rooms back there. If you ever want to see it, we can give you a show because everything that's going on in that radio program right now comes out of this building. Come this month, October, I'm going to start talking to uh, my AG brethren that are in the area where this radio station hits to see if they want to impact their area. This is a, something that's just kind of happening. There is a host of potential that we haven't even sat down and thought about all the different ways we can use this. Here's the deal. This radio station impacts everything from Coates, Minnesota, down on Highway 52, all the way through the cities to just short of Forest Lake. Just short of Forest Lake. Here's the thing. You know something, though? It's incredible, the number of people. This is not all about us doing selfishly. The work of the ministry is to reach people. Amen? It's like, no, we don't want it. We can't, you know, Force Lake can't do it. No, it's not about that. It's really not. What an incredible potential. Like I said, it's just beginning to find out and discover what is going on and the potential for this radio station. Um, 
Builders by Design, Dan and Becky Schultz. Uh, they've been gracious building the cabinetry in there and the desk work. Um, like I said, if you ever want to see where the radio ministry happens, where it takes care of, it's out of there. Uh, on staff, our business administrator, Dave Morley, um, works really, really hard. Gary Lundstrom, volunteering countless hours, getting the radio station going, making sure every T is crossed, every I is dotted. Every single day, a log has to be filled out. The FCC is, is like OSHA on steroids. It's incredible. But we're just beginning to explore it. I mean, Cody, their son-in-law, uh, Kevin and Jill Ritchie works on it a lot. Uh, Justin, their son. Again, it's something that's going on, has been for several months, that you've never heard of. Lastly, let me just... No, two more things. The Amberella House. Friends, these things are on, on the horizon. They're right before us. And we're going to go after these four things. We've got to go after it. I just really feel impressed. When you think about the brokenness and the abuse in this day and age which we live with sex trafficking, sex abuse, it's like every day. It's just amazing. And I firmly feel in my spirit that we can't, this is not something we're going to talk about for a few years. It's going to take some money. It's going to take some resources to find or build and re refab a home that has at least 10 beds in it that we can become a resource to young girls especially that have been so abused. Pastor Mike, that's ridiculous. Aren't you trying to raise money for the building? Yep. Guess what? Pastor Mike, it's ridiculous. Aren't we trying to build a new building? What are you going to do in North Branch too? I don't know what. I just know this. If God's in it, it's going to happen. Are there a lot of obstacles? Yep. But guess what, friends? We're going to do it. We are going to do this. We're not going to be talking about it. It's not going to be out there. I just really feel mandated by God. We're going we get to move and we're going to continue to press on towards this. Um, there's a, a prosecuting attorney for Washington County. He says, man, he's in a task force that they're going after these things and going after it. He says, here's the thing. Tragically, when we arrest them, you know, we prosecute the, the, the men that are involved in this to the nth degree, but the women, we have nowhere to put them. Tragically, they've been just abused, they're broken, and there are no beds for them to go to. And all I can think of is, you know something, by God, Maranatha is going to build a house and we're going to be able to minister the love of Jesus to as many broken lives as we can. Amen? Yeah. yeah. Amen. Okay, lastly, okay, the challenge in front of us is to spruce up and take care of this building. Number two, the radio station. Number three, an Amberella house. Number four, is a renewed emphasis on our ministry philosophy. You know, I think, unfortunately, Maranatha, um, the community, has gotten used to it. Oh, that's Maranatha. Yeah, they've been there. It's kind of whatever. You know, I feel it in my bones to get in trouble. I like being in trouble sometimes. I really do. In fact, when things are too quiet around the staff, I mean, years ago, I remember all the time, um, they go, uh-oh, things have been peaceful here around a long time. Pastor Mike's probably going to be up to something. Because I don't like, I mean, it's just, I like, let's rattle some cages. Let's make some noise. Let's cause some trouble in the devil's turf. Amen? Amen. Let's do that. I don't want to live life safe. I, I like you want to slide into heaven sideways going, woo! Oh, made it. What a blast. <laughs> I mean, just, I don't want to live safe. You don't score points for entering heaven without bruises. No points scored. Doesn't happen that way. Our goals, Maranatha's goals have never changed. In fact, they're going to be re-emphasized. In fact, in the, in the coming weeks, I'm going to be re-emphasizing what we're all about to get us all back on the same page in a great way. But friends, we're here to worship God, to draw people to Jesus, to teach and train, and to influence our community. That's what we're going to do. Amen? Amen. Praise God. As you can see,